Lugbanga and Singer. Okay, so a lot of you will have just had the notification if you're on the webinar with us that this has been recorded. Um, those of you on Facebook won't have probably seen that notification. So um, you can basically just ignore what I'm saying. Um, Croeso, uh, a welcome. So Croeso is just welcome in Welsh. Um, we are joining you from the School of Management uh, at Swansea University. And um, the image on screen, I guess, shows you where we are. Um, and it's not quite as sunny as that today, but we welcome you all the same. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, the webinar we're going to be sharing with you today is um, one focused on systems thinking. So we are very, very lucky to have uh, Dr. Paul Davis with us, who is our MBA director and the program development lead for the School of Management. Um, so we're gonna be hearing a lot from Paul um, on today's session, but of course there's an opportunity at the end um, for a Q&A if you've got any questions about the MBA in particular, or maybe any other uh, management uh, courses or any other School of Management courses in general, whether that's accounting and finance or economics. So I think it's probably nice to just briefly introduce Paul and then I will um, just go through a quick welcome slide and then we can go back to Paul then for the session. Paul, do you want to say hello to those people that have just joined? Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, pleasure to have you with us. And uh, hopefully uh, the talk will be, will so raise some interesting ideas and some thoughts. We'll leave you with some questions to take away and to think about. And, uh, and as Saf said, yeah, please ask us uh, whatever questions uh, we can help with. So use the time for your benefit and uh, we hopefully we can help as much as we possibly can. Thanks, Paul. Um, could you share the next slide, Paul, and then um, we'll see where we are. So you can see our snazzy, uh, our snazzy media suite there. So Paul and I are both on Bay Campus today. Um, Paul is in our media suite, so we have great technology that lots of our lecturers have been using. And you can see Paul with a screen there. Um, and uh, this is obviously what we're, we've set up the webinar through. So lots of our students would actually receive lectures in a similar way. So you're getting quite an authentic experience um, today, wherever you are in the world. So just a few um, quick rankings really, not gonna spend too much time on this slide because a lot of you will already know a lot about Swansea University. Um, for those that don't, um, we are a very proud uh, university that is celebrating its centenary year this year. So 100 years old, which uh, is, is quite an age. Um, and we're very proud of, of that re our reputation being um, you know, a traditional university, very research focused, but with always um, an industry lead. So Swansea University was set up with industry in mind, you know, back in 1920. And we were on our beautiful Singleton campus. Um, and now we have our lovely Bay campus for which around 50% of our, uh, you know, sort of courses are taught with half of the faculties on, on each campus. Um, you can see we are a member of the AACSB. So, you know, high quality here with relation to our MBA teaching and all other courses. And we're recognized for really good postgraduate study, which uh, is always nice, especially when it comes from the students, as you can see from, from that Student Choice Award there. So my name's Sophia. Um, you can ask me and my colleagues any questions, please put them in the Q&A because then we can share them and I can read the questions through and I won't miss anyone. Um, please do that whether you're on um, Facebook Live or on the webinar, we'll try and get those answered for you. I was actually a student at Swansea. Um, I finished my master's about 10 years ago, so quite a while ago, um, but I am joining you as a, you know, a past alum, um, but also as a member of staff. So um, hopefully I can answer uh, any questions you might have then. And if you can go to the next slide, please, Paul. I don't know if you wanna add anything there before we move on. Uh, no, we'll build on some of those things as we're going through. So hopefully, as I said, the talk as well will trigger some questions and some, some thoughts that you might have with us. So yeah, we'll see what comes up. Thanks, Paul. If you can tap through to a few or more of them, brilliant. Bab, so I've just talked about our 100 years, which you can see in our logo there, and the two beautiful campuses. Um, we're currently on Bay Campus, so that's the one on the top left of the screen. And that was built in 2015. So it's quite a new campus. We're benefiting from uh, you know, high tech, um, like the, the studio that Paul is in, but some great facilities. Um, you know, we have lots of industry co-located with us here on campus. So we have Fujitsu within this building. Um, the engineering department have uh, companies like um, Rolls-Royce and Jaguar. So, you know, lots and lots of things happening on campus. Similar story for Singleton campus. So 
that beautiful um, park campus, again, really close to the beach, but I think Bay Campus is closer. So we're really happy about that, uh, those of us that are here in the School of Management. And that houses our faculties such as arts and humanities, uh, medicine, human and health sciences. So between the two campuses, we have a lot of different courses. The School of Management building then is the one that's lit up um, on the right hand side. And that's the building that Paul and myself are sat in today and where many of our students um, are currently studying um, or will be studying in January or indeed, you know, studying a bit of a hybrid model of some things online and some in person. So we're very proud of our, our lovely School of Management, but we are a dual campus university. So we know we, we have staff and students across both. Okay, next slide then, please, Paul. So this is the bit you've all been waiting for. So I will hand over to Paul and, and leave um, you to a really exciting session. Um, you know, systems thinking, as Paul is going to share with you, is something that is sure to be of interest to anyone that's wanting to go into um, a business related degree, going to be working in some sort of organization. So hopefully whoever you are and wherever you are, you're going to get something really valuable from this session. So thanks so much for, for taking the time to deliver this, Paul, and thanks everyone for joining. Okay, thanks, Ash. So welcome. Yeah, so we'll just going to do about 15, 20 minutes just to introduce ideas around systems thinking and how that can help us understand organisations. And as Saf says, systems thinking, as hopefully as we'll see when we go through, is fundamental really to understanding how we operate and the way in which we interact and work with others. So anybody going into management, and certainly if you're looking at something like the MBA, where you're, you're looking to draw together lots of elements of organizations and understand how they work in a more uh, collective and, and sort of total way, then you are essentially operating and working with systems. So there's a few thoughts and a few ideas that I want to, to leave with you and give you an opportunity to take away. Um, and then hopefully said a chance to have a bit of a Q&A then towards the end. So it's probably a good idea to start with a little bit of a context. Um, and the, the quote I've used here from Russell Ackoff, I use a lot in my teaching when I'm, I'm talking with students and working with students around ideas of systems. And my background is strategy. So I look at the way in which organizations think about their direction, about how they look to understand the purpose and the way in which the business, uh, whether it's a private sector, large organization, or whether it's a small business or a not-for-profit. And there's so many different types of organizations out there. And you may well be going into you know, a whole range of them during your career. So the, the Akoff quote is, is a useful starting point. And Russell Akoff was, um, was a, a really eminent uh, thinker around systems thinking, particularly in the sort of uh, 80s and uh, 90s. Um, and there's a couple of things that are quite nice about this quote that really emphasize why systems are important to be aware of, even if you're not necessarily going to carry on and develop your thinking or your you're, uh, you're learning too much in that direction. Um, so it also gives me a chance to play around with the magic board as well, which has been very entertaining for the talks that I've been doing. So one of the things which Akoff picks up is the idea that problems are elements or realities in organizational life, which are not independent. So when we're trying to deal with something, even though we may look at it in its own and we may look at it in a very local, very specific way, we can often forget that it's influenced by lots of other things. And then this is where systems really start to help us make sense of what's influencing behavior and why having a larger and a broader understanding and maybe realize more clearly what might be going on. Okay, we'll pick up on a few of those ideas as we run through the, the talk this afternoon. So if we then realize that things are not islands and silos of activity, then we start to develop and get a, a sense of what we can start to refer to as complex systems. And organizations of any size are inherently complex things mainly because there's lots of stuff going on. There's lots of people working in them. They may be in lots of different locations. They may have lots of different functions. So as soon as we start to have a number of different elements influencing each other, we start to then get a more complicated and a more difficult way of trying to make sense of things. Um, and we'll come on to this 
idea a little bit later as well, which Akoff then talked about as messes. So what we're trying to do a lot in organizations and certainly what we teach and, and what we sort of set up as part of the learning on our courses from MBA through to our undergraduate courses is to really give students uh, an ability to understand theories and practice so that they can then go into that career and into their future and be more confident that they can handle messy situations. And the more you can think about managing those messes and being constructive and, and relevant in what you're doing, the more fun, the more enjoyable it is and the more valuable you become to others. So essentially then Akoff was talking about organizations and business problems as being much more interrelated, much more complex than we sometimes may think or may hope that they are. So it's useful then to, to pause and normally when I'm teaching and certainly when I'm introducing new ideas and new theories to, to students, one of the things I'd like to do is sort of set up some quotes or some context that gives us a starting point. So we can then sort of understand where we're building from in the way in which we then start to explore and, and develop the subject area. And um, well, Bertel Anfi is uh, a German theorist who moved to America in the 40s and 50s and is kind of uh, regarded as the starting point of systems thinking. And the bit that he really adds to our understanding is that idea of mutual interaction, things relating to each other. So we can start then to identify some elements that help us work out what a system is trying to do and how we can then maybe make more sense and understand our thinking about those systems. So firstly, systems occur in lots of different ways. So we've got natural and man-made systems. And the three examples we've got there, the solar system, the human body, an urban uh, environment are all themselves inherently complex things but they all have a purpose whether it's man-made in terms of the traffic systems the, the energy systems that allow the lighting the building regulations and planning systems that enable buildings to develop or whether it's more naturally occurring so my body the human body is made up of a number of different systems which then work collectively to make me able to do the things I do, whether it's moving around, which I rarely think about, you know, we just so used to our bodies that we just do things. So those systems that enable things to happen, but also importantly, and this is something I'll come back to quite a bit in, in the elements I want to introduce for you, is that it's the relationships between things which are really valuable. So something on its own, so in an urban environment, that road on its own is useful, but it's only really useful if it's linked up to others, if it allows people to drive around it. It's only useful if there are, particularly in some settings, lights and all the safety features around that allow that then to be a more useful uh, value to us as members of society. So things have a limited value on their own, even though they're still worth exploring and they're still worth analyzing. It's the way in which they enable other things to happen or they work then in relation to something else, which can be absolutely fascinating. So essentially, what we mean by a system is a collection of things interacting with each other in order to enable something to be done or something to be achieved. And hopefully you can see why that's quite relevant then to how we think about organizations, because fundamentally, organizations are collections of things coming together in order for something to be achieved, something to be done. So that's a, a useful starting point, but inevitably there are some principles or some elements of systems thinking which are, are helpful to be aware of and then to use them as our sort of stepping stones for our thought process. So firstly, and this is quite a critical one, and certainly for me as a strategy lecturer, this is something that I am more comfortable with and I think is hugely important when we look at, at business and we look at understanding the way businesses work. And that is the idea that it's holistic. So we're looking at things in total. So the system as, as a complete thing. So 
the fun of using technology is when it doesn't want to play. Okay, let's put up all the points. And then we know where we are. So five elements that we can start to draw from when we can think about. And we've touched on the second one already, the idea of relationships and interaction. So it's the way things impact on each other, which is really fascinating. And as we talked about with the previous examples, the, the solar system, the human body and urban environment, inevitably there is a collection or hierarchy of systems. So this is part of the difficulty sometimes of making sense of systems is how do you define where a system ends and another begins? Inevitably, they influence each other. So my human body has lots of systems in it, but I'm also interacting with other people. So we, I am part of a system that is then around me. So this can become quite difficult. So it is useful to understand and to be identifying boundaries. And again, from an organizational perspective, and certainly when you're learning and you're studying, one of the things we talk about with our students is clarifying the boundaries of your analysis. What are you looking at in a piece of work? And why have you identified those boundaries? And that's really valuable in helping you focus your ideas and focus your thinking on really uh, effective areas. And then for me, in some ways, the bit that I'm really interested in is the idea of social systems. And again, this is why I think this is relevant for organizational analysis and for understanding business. Businesses is about people and the way people interact and work together. So seeing that social element is quite a powerful way of providing a different viewpoint on what a system is looking to do and how it's working. So I mentioned that we wanted to give you some thoughts and some ideas to take away and to think about. So thought number one, and that is to identify a system that you're familiar with or you've been part of, you may have work that you then draw on. And think about what are the elements, what are the different bits that you can identify within that system? And then more importantly, the second part of that thought process then is how do they appear to be connected? Because often it's the way they're connected and how we can change that, that we can then start to think about. So things like lean philosophy and lean thinking, which is widely uh, used across a number of different types of organizations, is really about looking at how things are linked together and redesigning, re-evaluating the way they could be developed. So if we build on that thought of identifying particular system and example of system, then we come into, for me, for my view of strategy and how I look at organizations, the bit that is really fascinating. And that is the idea of the, the social, the human perspective on systems. And one of the, the academics that I really loved when I was doing my masters and I did my dissertation on systems thinking uh, was a guy called Peter Checkland. And he came up with or developed ways of looking, which he referred to as human activity systems. And what he was really talking about was, it's a danger sometimes that we forget about us, the people that are involved in, in systems and the way in which those systems work. And what's really important there is that once you've got a number of people together discussing and exploring something, they are inevitably gonna bring different viewpoints. Yeah, and this is one of the joys of teaching uh, on a number of our courses and certainly on our MBA is that we will have people from lots of different backgrounds, either from different countries, so different origins or from different industries. So engineering, sciences, pharmaceuticals, uh, business, humanities, and all those people bring different experiences and different views of the world into the classroom. And that is incredibly powerful because that helps our understanding. It develops our thinking and I learn. So teaching MBAs over the last sort of 20 years, 15, 20 years or so has been hugely instructive for me and my understanding of how businesses work and how that may operate in different parts of the world. So that idea of people being part of systems is a hugely powerful addition to what we're thinking about, but it does raise some issues. So if we add that to, to thought number one, we can introduce then our second thought. And this is, once you've identified what that system is and the elements, if you think about the people engaged in that system, does that change things? So 
do people have different views of what can be done or how it should be done? And they might then become a little bit more difficult to manage. So people are in inherently fascinating, but we're also very complex. And that's often, as you'll find when you're studying management, is often the really difficult bit in how to manage situations and the messes that Akoff talked about. So two thoughts then I'd like to you to take away and spend a little bit of time just thinking about because they will help you with a lot of the ideas that you'll come on to in your future studies and challenges you'll face in your careers. So building on that, and so now having some, some fundamentals and some basic ideas in place, we can now start to put in some, some thoughts and some tools that can help our, our way of looking at things. Um, and I like this model by PID, and I use this quite a lot in my teaching around strategy and around knowledge sharing, because it helps us to identify what's in front of us in terms of what are we trying to resolve. So what PID was starting to talk about and others have explored is the nature of what's in front of us or the problem or the situation. Okay, actually, problem is sometimes uh, uh, the wrong word because it seems that we only look at these things when things are going wrong. We should be looking at these things all the time because it's about our understanding of what's happening around us. So on the left hand side of our spectrum, our scale, we have a puzzle and we're all familiar with puzzles. Puzzles are something which has been set up for us to solve. So there's an agreed formulation, the problem we know, a crossword, a Sudoku, a maze, all of these things are puzzles which have been created and they have a solution. So our task if we want to be logical and we want to train our brain and we want to, you know, uh, extend our, our grey matter, our brain cells, is to work out whether we can actually solve the puzzle. So some people love doing crosswords, some people love doing Sudokus. There's loads of ways in which we can use that to help our brain work. So puzzles are fine because they're quite defined and they're quite straightforward. Then we have, in the middle, a slightly uh, greyer, uh, example and we refer to these and we talk about these as problems. So a problem is something which we're all comfortable with, we know what the problem is, but there might be different solutions as to how to overcome that problem. So think of it, an example could be that we want to get from one side of a river to another. So we know what the problem is, we're on the wrong side, but there are a number of ways in which we can go about solving that problem. So for example, we could look for a boat or we can make a raft if we have the time and we could then get ourselves across. If the river is not that big and if we're quite confident swimmers, we could just say, well, the quickest way to get across is just to swim. So they're both perfectly suitable al alternative solutions, but they're different. If we want to take a longer term view and we want other people to be able to cross, we might then start thinking about building a bridge. Or we might go further down the river and find somewhere which is shallower and we can wade across. So there's lots of ways in which that problem could be solved, but we know what it is we're trying to do. And then we come back to Akoff's messes and complex systems. And this is often where we find business and we find management. And the difficulty here is a mess is something we haven't agreed what the issue is. And the, the problem that some organizations face often is that they very quickly try and identify a problem before they've really understood what's involved and what's going on. So part of systems thinking is not just to come up with a solution, but it's also to understand the nature of the mess. So can we identify and think a little bit more about what's going on and what might be influencing and causing what's happening? And the more we understand it, the more we know what the system is doing and why it's doing it, the more we can design then hopefully a more effective solution. So hopefully that's quite a useful way of thinking about how the nature of what's in front of you will offer different characteristics or different requirements. We can then start to think about the tools that we would use in order to solve those different challenges. So for a puzzle, the toolbox is really our logical ability to work out the rules of the game. So systems thinking and a toolbox is an, um, an example I use a lot. Okay, my students do probably get a bit fed up with me saying a toolbox is a really good way of thinking about this. And the reason for that is because when you come in and when we're, we're teaching and we're working with our students, one of the things I always tell my students is I'm not gonna give you the answer. 
because I don't know what your challenges are going to be. Okay, I don't know what careers you're going to go into. I don't know where you're going to be working. There's all a number of things which are going to be unique to your circumstance. What I can do though, and what we do across the School of Management, is we help you identify and understand theory and practice and models which will build your toolbox. So we add to your toolbox a range of ways of looking at different parts of business so that you then in your career are more confident and are more aware of which tools to bring out in order to help you with whatever challenge is facing you. So within systems thinking, and all I want to do just briefly this afternoon is just introduce the idea of three of these tools. Um, the first one is very much about sort of identifying where we are. So the, a map analogy is quite handy here. So the idea of surfacing the issues is to fully understand what's going on. So what is actually happening with the system? And this is important because often we don't fully understand or we don't fully identify what might be taking place around us. We make lots of assumptions sometimes. We may not understand a different part of the organization. So we don't know the pressures that they're facing. So surfacing the issues gives us a sense of where we are now. Once we've done that, then we can have a little bit more of an idea of where we're trying to get to. So again, the map analogy is quite useful here. We've identified where we are on the map and why we're here. We now want to identify where we're trying to get to. What should the system be achieving? And then finally, once we've got that in place, then we can start to think a little bit more about, okay, what have we now got to do in order to overcome that? How do we make our system better? How do we improve the way it works so that the output that we're going to benefit from is also then attractive and useful for us. Inevitably, given restraints and resource pressures and all the other things that you know real life tends to throw at us within organizations. But part of this, and the reason why I think systems thinking is so powerful as a way of looking at, at challenges, is that it's about people. So you can do systems thinking on your own. But I tend to find from my experience, you only go so far because your brain will only think about certain things. Whereas as soon as you bring other people into a conversation in a constructive way, then we learn from each other. And so that social aspect of systems thinking can be incredibly powerful because it does one very, very simple thing. It provides an environment where we communicate. And from my experience for a number of years working with companies and in education, the key bit of working well is having really strong communication, either in small teams or then across an organization. But it's also, it's also quite a difficult thing to achieve. So systems thinking does offer tools that help us talk to each other, help us think. So let's have a think about it or just briefly introduce some of those tools. The first one is the picturing the perceptions. So what we have here are referred to as rich pictures. And you may have come across uh, examples of these uh, previously without necessarily maybe being aware that it's, it's part of a systems thinking approach. So rich pictures, as you can see from the examples, are designed to provide an image which captures people's feelings and awareness and ideas. So it's not meant to be a flow diagram. It's much, meant to be much more powerful. Uh, and the idea here is, you know, a picture paints a thousand words. Images can be incredibly strong in capturing our views and our understanding. And a lot of organizations use picturing as a way of helping them with strategic uh, dialogue and with strategic decision making. So this is something which kind of lives outside of systems thinking on its own. So that's the current situation. That gives us an idea of where we are now. What we can then start to do, and this is where you can see the, the modeling and the design can get more detailed and can get much more involved, is that we start to look at influence diagrams. And this comes back to the idea of interrelationships. Within our system, what activity is influencing something else? Because it's that relationship which is where the value is being derived. Okay, Akar famously talks about uh, a motor car and says, if you take a car apart, you have lots of bits of the car, but you haven't got a car. The engine is hugely valuable, but the engine is only important if there's fuel going into it and it's able then to motor the axle and move the wheels. So a car is a system. And it's only as strong as the, the bits and the way in which it works together. Take the petrol out and you can have a really expensive car not going anywhere. So that influence diagram allows us to explore where we can then add value and develop the parts of the system that can then have greater impact, 
greater value for us, regarding you know, whatever the example might be. And then finally, and this is a little bit more contentious, this is something that Checkland um, introduced and something I think is really helpful, but is also quite difficult to do in organisations. And this is to think about what else could the system be for? So if you understand the purpose of a system, it's useful sometimes not to just assume that it has to have that purpose all the time. And this is important from a strategic perspective, because one of the things I ask companies when I work with them is, you know, what is your point? Why do you exist? And it's a really simple question, but it's a really difficult one to sometimes answer because we take it for granted. So the purpose of a system is built around understanding three very simple elements. What's coming into it? So again, a system has things coming in, which are then being changed in some way. And finally, they're being changed for a reason. So what's coming out? What's the, what's the end product? And the more we think about how that can be looked at in different ways, remember those different viewpoints that I mentioned earlier, we can actually then start to understand what might be limitations or what are um, underused values within our system. So those tools are essentially important in just allowing us to think more critically about what's in front of us. And that's something which is hugely relevant to what we do within the School of Management and how we want you to be developing and, and uh, stretching your thinking and your criticality and, and your ability to look at things in a much more rounded way. And to help with that, then, this, I suppose, the summarizing thoughts to, to tie up what we've been looking at uh, this afternoon, hopefully kind of give those sort of uh, critical elements, which are really valuable, I think, in whatever area of a career and whatever area of learning you go into. So, as we mentioned, a couple of times, um, and apologies for using the words often, but they are so important to the way systems operate. It's very difficult to look at systems thinking without taking a broader overview, the holistic view, looking at things in their entirety. But as we said, being able to define boundaries, because sometimes we have to distinguish between different systems, even though they're influencing each other. That boundary setting is part of our thought process, it's part of our decision making. And that tells us something as well. So that holistic view is critical. But most importantly, and from my experience, this is the bit that organizations sometimes forget. It's the bit, it's the relationships between things. And the frustration here is sometimes we don't get as much value out of things around us because we don't realize they influence each other. And if we don't see that opportunity, we can't maximize it. So this is why I think problems are often the wrong phrase, it's situations. So if we look at the situation around us, we can then look at it from a systems perspective to identify where they may be um, underutilized, undervalued relationships, which could be really powerful as the organization, as the environment, as our markets tend to change. And hopefully, as I've mentioned a couple of times uh, in this afternoon session, by going through this, we learn about ourselves. We learn about the system we're part of. We learn about the systems that drive the organization. And it's very difficult to make changes unless you learn. And you know, that's a huge part of what we do in the School of Management and why the courses are so relevant is that we're trying and we are creating an environment and fostering a learning and a critical questioning approach, which you then take out into your careers and you then make changes which are going to be valuable for you and your wider communities. So those are sort of summary, summarizing ideas and principles, I guess, which I think are really valuable in what systems thinking is allowing us to achieve. There are a couple of links that we've set up and uh, are there for you to, to follow through and to check out you know, after today's talk. Um, so please, you know, if you get a chance, if you want to scan those to follow those through, that would be uh, there's a whole world of information and ideas out there, which will these will start you on the road to. But uh, thanks for your time and thanks for your patience, and uh, hopefully, you know, if there's any questions, we'll be happy to to work our way through them. Thank you so much, Paul. That was a brilliant session. Um, I'm really enjoyed it, and I'm sure everyone else did. And we've got quite a few questions coming in on the Q&A um, and on the Facebook chat. If you could just switch over to the final slide, Paul, before we jump into the Q&A, um, 
there we go thanks ever so much just to give everyone an opportunity um, for those that are on the Facebook live watching um, a recording or obviously with us on the webinar there's a couple of things that you can do if you want to find out more about uh, the School of Management in general, um, any of the courses that uh, myself and Paul have mentioned, or if you actually want to find a bit more about um, maybe applying for the university, if that's something that has really um, kind of piqued your interest, especially after watching Paul's lecture, um, which is fantastic. I think we all want to join the MBA now and study systems thinking. So on the left hand side, you can see uh, you can chat with current students. We've got an amazing platform called uh, Unibuddy and we have a range of undergraduate and postgraduate uh, students that are live on there. Um, and if you use the QR code um, or you can search Unibuddy through the Swansea website, you can actually talk to someone from your home country or maybe um, from a subject that you're studying. It doesn't have to be someone from um, from where you are from and you can get a bit of insight into maybe you know what Swansea is like. We have got a lot of online resources. So this is the first of uh, many webinars that we will um, be uh, doing for, for the School of Management. So you can find more of those um, via our web pages. And then um, the, final, the final part then is we have got a virtual open day. The next one for postgraduate students is in March uh, and there will be some more for undergraduate students earlier in the year. So have a look uh, on the website, but that QR code will take you to the registration for the March open day all of our social media channels of course you can follow us look at all our pictures um, there's lots of pictures of the beach um, which tends to be what you'll see lots of from us and, and the lovely surroundings of Swansea our telephone number is there but you can book a one-to-one -one session um, with myself with any of the colleagues from admissions within the school or with Paul if you want to talk in more detail about your suitability for the MBA so you can book that through emailing us on that SOM recruitment email address so I think that covers everything. Um, I think we can move on to the Q&A. If anyone does want us to go back to this slide, or I'll leave this on in the background perhaps, and then Paul, you might wanna to jump to your own slides then if there's uh, relevant questions. Okay. Uh, there's some lovely comments coming through um, saying thank you very much for your time, Paul. Um, I think we can all agree that was a really, really brilliant session. Um, saying that this is amazing. Someone feels like, or oh, Ish feels like she's in the class. Or oh, Ish, Ish Madan, yeah, feels like they're in the class. So thank you, Paul. And Paul, you interviewed Ish um, for the MBA. So that's fantastic. We're having people join us that hopefully we're gonna be seeing in January. So um, this is really lovely. And thank you for joining. Shall we move to the, let's have a look at the Q&A. So I've got a question here from Clive um, and you might want to jump in if I'm not saying this correct and just pop it in the chat, but is an aligned organization to team to personal future purpose, the best way um, to direction find through a mess. So I think that's probably referring to one of your slides, Paul. Yeah. Uh, so is an aligned organization um, team personal future purpose, the best way to direction find through a mess. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Thanks for that one. It's, um, so it's the, the key bit is having a clear idea of what you're talking about and what you're using to develop that communication. And it'll vary from different uh, organization to organization. So one of the other things that I always talk about with my students is be wary of a one size fits all approach because uh, businesses vary so much in size and scale, in, in you know, geography and in, in nature. And one of the things we talk about a lot and we will be covering on the MBA are different types of organizations. We don't just focus on corporations you know, as important as they are in the business world. So yeah, the, the tricky bit with understanding a mess is having a clear method to enable you to discuss and to communicate. Um, and certainly from when I've worked with colleagues, the, the easiest thing often is having a, a whiteboard and a bunch of pens and then just to get your ideas. Because essentially that's what systems thinking is really exploring is being able to develop your thinking. What do you see going on? And then to explain and think about, is that really what's happening? And, and the key bit, hopefully, which came through with a different viewpoint, so I think this might come into the, uh, the question then about teams, is having people from different parts of a system involved. So you're getting a, a different perspectives on what a system does. And that's hugely important because said, I can only know so much of what's happening around me because I can only see so much. So it's really good to have people with different views, different experiences, different ideas of what a system is doing. Um, but messes are tricky. 
and some people find them very uncomfortable. You know, they, they try and get simple answers quickly, which often don't necessarily deal with uh, the real issue at hand. Hope that helps. Thanks, Paul. That, that was a really great question. Um, I'm going to move to another one then that's for Paul. Um, really good question here. Without humans, there can be no organizational systems for humans. So are systems inherently culturally biased? <laughs> That's a really good one. Um, I would say culturally influenced, maybe more than culturally biased. So yeah, certainly the systems, human social systems are going to reflect the people that are part of them. Okay, that's, that's part of the fascination. That's part of the fun. And that's why sometimes it's dangerous to look at a, a successful example from one organization and assume you can do it in a different organization. Because even if you're in the same sector, the same industry, the people, the experience, the background, the culture are all going to be slightly different. So one of the things I talk about in my research, so my research background is qualitative research. I like talking to people. Okay? I don't tend to do statistics and numbers. Um, and the reason I like talking to people is because I'm interested in lessons. And again, this is part of, of you know, the value and what we do in the classroom is that we bring case studies in, we bring organizations, we bring guest lectures in, not to tell you this is absolutely true, but to tell you and to show you lessons of what people have learned or mistakes people have made. And then to think, okay, what can you draw from that that will be relevant for you? So, um, so yeah, that's uh, that, the cultural element, I think you're right, is, is a hugely important element, uh, factor. Um, and it's something which, again, is, is quite a complex thing to think about. So people often find it quite difficult to address because it is you know, a tough thing to, to make sense of, but incredibly fascinating. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, really good question, actually. It's, um, That's too blind us to start. Yeah, really amazing <laughs> questions. So thank you so much for, for those coming through. Oh, got another one. I'm just going to ask. Let me just quickly read that. Search for... OK, so in a nutshell, can I say that the concept of understanding the what, how and why of the entire process of the MBA programme is what we can call as systems thinking? <laughs> um, yeah, and, it, and then the system that well, the MBA is a system of modules and elements which come together for the learning and for your experience. Um, and that the what, why, and the how are really good. And I think if we were developing that talk further, one of the things I go on and talk about with my students is understanding and, and the why question. So systems thinking is very, very good at helping us understand why something is taking place. Whether that's good or bad, it's, you know, it's up for judgment. But um, yeah, no, and those sort of questions are the sort of things to be having while you're working through the MBA. So you're getting as much out of it as you possibly can. Remember that toolbox that I was referring to, um, those questions are really powerful parts to have in the toolbox. Great answer, Paul. And yeah, it's, um, it's actually really interesting to start applying some of the, the concepts of you know, systems thinking to actual programmes, as we said. And this is just one part of the vast amount of um, material, I guess, that's taught on the MBA, but also on other programmes. And I think what's, what is so great is actually... Um, the availability of some of these and how they span across a lot of the uh, different courses that we've got and um, you know a lot of the different things that people are interested in you, it might not just be on the MBA course for example that you would explore elements of systems thinking it would be um, kind of picked out within lots of other modules and, and subject areas. I'm just going to check the chat again for a couple more questions let's see if there's any more subject specific ones for Paul more thanks coming in Paul on the chat so that's lovely Thank you very much. it really does feel like we're in a lecture class doesn't it <laughs> so this is actually a really good example of how some of the lectures are looking now for Swansea students that are um, having blended learning obviously because of COVID um, and, you know, if those of you are looking to perhaps apply for a course in January, we are still taking applications. So if you want more information, you can get that by dropping me an email on the SOM recruitment uh, email there. But this is very much part of what you might experience uh, as a student coming, you know, for this September just gone and perhaps in January is a little bit of a blended learning approach. So seeing Paul on the screen, a very interactive lecture, uh, and then you're able to view that back then. Um, 
using our kind of online platforms, which is allowing for quite a lot of engagement and students feeling actually really close to their lecturers is what we've heard, which is always really nice. Okay, I'm just gonna check. Oh, there's another one, please. Okay, what's the email someone has asked? So I'm just gonna pop that in the chat. It is on the, um, it's on the screen as well. So it's some recruitment at swansea.ac.uk. Uh, and I'm just gonna type that in the chat. So for those of you that are watching the recording, you should be able to see that on the screen. Okay, so a couple of questions then here um, about scholarships. So someone has applied for a scholarship and is awaiting the outcome. So good luck, good luck with that. Uh, we are hoping to have the, um, the scholarships finalized by um, the end of next week. So the deadline is the 30th of November. And so we should be sending out um, confirmations as soon as we can after that. So fingers crossed for you, you will be successful with a scholarship. Um, there are many, um, many scholarships available for students coming to study with us and um, lots of guaranteed scholarships for, for certain um, domiciles. So please just get in touch if you want any or more information about scholarship specific inquiries. And just double check, I haven't missed anything. Um, another one about financial support. So I think I've answered that question to the student uh, directly, but there's lots of information on our web pages um, and various scholarships available depending on what program you might want to apply for. So yeah, we um, I can cover that off if you want to get in touch with us um, and look on the website as well. Okay. I'm just going to walk through the chat, Paul. Is there any sort of closing comments you'd like to share um, with, with everyone that we've got before we draw things to a close? I think that's probably most of the questions now that have come through. No, that's, uh, I have got you. another one. <laughs> thanks for the questions. They were, they were really good ones. It's always nice to have ones that kind of stop you and make you think about things. Absolutely. So there's a question come through from Andrew. Are there any plans to offer an executive MBA? Um, that's an interesting one. We've got a full-time MBA program and we've got a flexible MBA starting in September uh, 2021, which is more for sort of a part-time blended delivery. Um, yeah, we've tend, we've got executive education that courses that we run as well. So we've got a portfolio that we're, that we're developing around uh, a range of different courses and we'll be promoting those and starting to advertise those a little bit more. Um, but yeah, some places have an executive, edu executive education and it's kind of designed or it's meant to be aimed at sort of chief exec sort of level. Uh, we're looking at our MBA as being something which is relevant to people in a number of ranges of different um, parts of the organization. So a different parts of the management ladder, if you're on that sort of process. Uh, so it's a slightly different type of program. And the philosophy of the program is to look at uh, the way value is understood in different ways. So I think an executive MBA tends to be a little bit more niche and a bit more narrow in what it's looking to aim for. We've taken a different approach within the MBA in Swansea. Yeah, thanks, thanks Paul, for that. Um, we also have another program um, for those that might be watching uh, and interested is within the, um, the kind of DBA suite. So yeah, anything on our executive education portfolio you can find on the website, we'll get in touch with us for more information. Another great question that's come through from uh, one of our attendees. Uh, how can I leverage MBA to sales? Great one from Oleg Benga there. Thank you for that question. Um, what, what do you mean by sales in that one? So I'm guess from my interpretation, I'm seeing that as how can I leverage perhaps the the learning from an MBA to to help generate sales? Okay. Perhaps if you could um, clarify, uh, Oleg Benga, in the chat, if that is what you mean. But perhaps Paul, you can start with that one. Yeah, that's an interesting one, and it's uh, I suppose it comes back in that even though the MBA is a more generalist program, the skills and the the learning and the um, the level of awareness and understanding is is probably the really underpinning bit there. So it gives you, I know certainly from chatting to former students or students when they were finishing towards the end of the MBA, they were in work. And one of the things that was always fascinating was the number of times people said, you know, it's given me much more confidence in work to put ideas forward and to, to, to deal with people. I remember one student was chatting to me and said, oh, when I get consultants coming in now, I can ask them questions. Whereas in the past, I just, I accepted what they said because they were the consultant and I was just doing my job. Whereas now I've looked at different ways in which business works. And you can say, you can, you can see the fear in their eyes when you ask a relevant question because they suddenly think, oh no, this is somebody who can think and isn't just gonna accept that's what I need to do. 
So there isn't a kind of direct maybe correlation to selling as such, but it's the kind of underpinning skills and the softer skills and the thinking skills, which would be you know, much more profound. Yeah, that, that's a great answer, Paul. And um, we actually had a bit of confirmation then that it, it was regards to sales in fast moving consumer goods. So all of the things that Paul has just said are really applicable to any sort of sector. Um, I know from working in fast moving consumer goods myself and retail before I joined the university, that my master's programme just gave me much more confidence, as Paul has said, in understanding how all of the pieces fit together. Um, so I think, yeah, it can definitely leverage you know, increase in sales because you're going to have much more of an understanding on how you can influence all of the different stakeholders, whether that's within your own company, whether that's within the marketplace. Um, so I think it offers an amazing opportunity to level up that skill set that you've got and hopefully increase those sales. That's what we all want if we're working in business, isn't it? Another great question has come through. So Emma or Ema, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. How can the MBA program be applicable to the development of social entrepreneurship sector, especially in Africa? And uh, Emma or Ema is a Nigerian. So lovely to meet you. Uh, thank you for that. That's a good one. Uh, similar to the previous question, I guess, in that it's, that it's not about specific areas that we're going to focus and target on, that we will bring those in. As I said, one of the, 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 the philosophy of our MBA is to look at what we mean by value and to look at value understood in different ways. So in that, we are looking at um, not just sort of business profit making, but we're looking at more sustainable, more uh, socially aware businesses, which are increasingly uh, becoming a model which has been adopted in a lot of different territories. And it's a fascinating one. The idea that you can be making money, but you're also doing it in a sustainable, in a socially conscious way. Um, I know certainly the Exploring Organizational Purpose module that we're developing, uh, that one really draws on. That's the kind of strategy element and organizational behavior element. It's a big module at the start of the MBA. And that one, we are exploring those sort of questions and we'll be bringing different types of examples in. So again, you know, hopefully it, it will give you the, the context and the understanding of the how business practices work. And then the lessons that I mentioned that you can draw on then that, that can take you into applying those ideas in a more effective way. Yeah, really, really good question. And I think something that really strikes us, particularly within, you know, the marketing and admissions side of the MBA and our other courses is how much we focus and, and how much the course that, you know, Paul and others have developed for the MBA is around human values. So, you know, the social entrepreneurship side of things and looking at how um, communities are affected by business is, is so much more part of the MBA than perhaps a traditional MBA might be. So we're not just looking at shareholder value as, you know, traditional corporations might want to do, but actually looking at human value, how we can strengthen that and, um, and create that. So definitely applicable to uh, any of your, you know, your home countries, if you were looking to take that knowledge back and, and make a difference to society, which, um, you know, is, is an amazing thing to do. I think that's, oh, I've got another one pop up. Um, hello, great class is the question. Thank you very much. I'm sure Paul will be appreciative of all the lovely feedback. Uh, the question is, as a business analyst, how would the MBA program augment my analytical and management skills? Uh, that's a good one. Um, in a similar way, it's that kind of those broader um, sets of skills that we're looking at. So things like innovation and change module, you'd be looking at bringing in ways of understanding that. And certainly the economic side of the data analytics, uh, data decision making is, is taking a view of looking at sort of econometrics rather than it just being a sort of straightforward introduction to economics. The, the, those elements, those building blocks are covered, but it is very much about applying and thinking of the way in which you develop that decision making and you look at how you then are providing more informed decisions. So, yeah, I think with the nature of an MBA, is designed to be bringing in broader strands of learning and thinking and understanding and then it's how you then relate those and you know the, those provide that base for your thinking in your career so it's it's always difficult to cater for every particular example um, but we'll certainly you know uh, be bringing in and sort of data analytics at the moment and the way in which that sort of big data and blockchains are informing and are really driving business decisions is something that will get touched on across modules so what you'll often find the same with um, the sort of socially conscious business is that we may not look at those specifically across a whole section of a module, but it'll be drawn on in different ways. Uh, and one of the things I'm looking for with the guest speakers that we bring in then is that we can bring those views in from outside 
to augment uh, what we cover within the modules. Amazing stuff. Um, one final question, and this is a really good one actually, that links into some of the other comments through the chat. Can I look myself at being an entrepreneur after an MBA? Yeah, we'd certainly hope that your critical thinking skills, your confidence, your ability to understand and certainly the innovation and change module, I guess, would be the, probably the principal driver in that one. Um, and the beauty, as Saf mentioned earlier, we've got very, very good uh, employability and entrepreneur colleagues within the school. So there's a good uh, network of events and activities that we will be expecting MBA students. Um, MBA students will be fed up with me posting and forwarding network events to them because I will be expecting my students to be going to these activities and these events which are run around the school. So we're setting things up as an MBA, but the MBA must be part of the school and the students need to be engaging with the school. And there's, uh, we're very fortunate. I've worked in other institutions and we didn't have the level of support around entrepreneurial support and employability that we're lucky to have within the school and the university generally. So there's a huge opportunity to draw on uh, those sort of network and those ideas to really improve you know, your opportunities and, and help you channel and, and think about where your activities might then go in the future. Yeah, absolutely, Paul, you're, you're spot on there. And um, there's so much support that is available to students, regardless of whether they're on the MBA or on any of the programmes. Um, so, you know, right from the moment you get to the School of Management up until five years after you graduate, you would have that one-to-one -one careers consultation support, something that you would pay, you know, a significant amount of money for if you were accessing that in the private sector. And that's just standard for our for our students, which is an amazing resource. Um, lots of examples of some amazing businesses that have come out of university students while they've been studying with us. Um, and they've been able to be supported to take those ideas um, and make them you know, a commercial reality, which is uh, fantastic. Or a social enterprise reality. You know, Not everything is about um, just the money and the sales uh, necessarily. I think that kind of draws us to a close with the rest of the questions. Um, one more, when is it suitable for a social entrepreneur to apply for an MBA at the beginning or after years of experience? And I'm just gonna answer that one very quickly because with our MBA program, you do need three years of work experience typically. So this means that you can really contribute to the classroom. Um, and I think you probably see from the session that Paul has delivered, it's gonna be able to enrich um, the application of those theories um, and concepts you're being taught. However, you can apply for any master's program with an undergraduate degree that you wouldn't necessarily have to have work experience for. So if you are a social entrepreneur and you want more management knowledge, you want to be able to apply um, your ideas, then there are plenty of MSc management programs or related courses that would give you that baseline of, of knowledge you would need to succeed there. So um, please do get in touch with the email that we've put in and um, I can surely help you more on what course might be appropriate for you. Oh, and a lovely thank you from Ish. Thank you, Sophia. You've been amazing at handling all the questions. Bit of self-promotion there for myself. <laughs> well, then, no, <laughs> thank, you, uh, thank you to James and Rebecca for all of the hard work they've done. Thank you so, so much, Paul, um, for that amazing lecture today. Um, I think that draws us to a close. So thank you all for attending. Um, an amazing level of participation then, some great questions. And um, we hope to see some of you in Swansea very soon. Yeah, take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye. Cheers, Seth.